This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Kristen Steele about early talent recruitment trends and the connection with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Kristen Steele, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you. Where are you joining us from today? I am in the RTP area of North Carolina, Research Triangle Park. That includes Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. Um, I'm right smack dab in the middle, so I can get to just about anywhere pretty quickly. Yeah, very good. And I'm joining you from south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Today, we're going to be talking about early talent recruitment trends and how that also connects with diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts within organizations. So I'm super excited for this conversation. We've been preparing for it for a long time. It's a pleasure to finally have the chance to sit down with you and and explore this together. As we get started, I wanted to share Kristen's bio with everybody. Kristen Steele is a university recruitment consultant and a certified Clifton Strengths coach. In her role at Yellow, she works with employers to achieve their DEI goals by helping them virtually recruit qualified, diverse early career candidates more efficiently than ever before. Uh, Wonderful. Anything you would like to highlight about your personal background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation? I would love to. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, I have worked in higher ed, uh, worked with student athletes. I've worked in refugee resettlement, managing corporate, um, managing uh, employment programs, helping people become more self-sufficient when they get here, whether they are refugees, asylum seekers, or special immigrant visa holders. So my background is very eclectic in terms of the kind of audiences that I've worked with. Um, But most recently, that Gen Z population has been uh, the the group that I have the most experience with, with a decade or more in higher ed. Um, So really happy to be talking about my experiences coming from that space in career services and now working with employers. So again... (laughs) Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and maybe start by telling us a little bit. I mean, so so working with younger um, early career professionals, they're they're launching their careers yeah. uh, like you refer to Gen Z, you, younger millennials or Gen Z. It's yeah. a little bit of a different thing, right, um, in terms bit. of priorities and what they're looking for in in work and career. But you also just highlighted, which I think is super fascinating, uh, work with refugee populations and other unique populations of individuals. Uh, maybe to start by telling us a little bit more about that and and how organizations can leverage those talent pools. And perhaps these are entire groups of people that ha- they haven't really been tapping into in the past. Absolutely. I think very different time frame. Uh, I worked with refugees and asylum seekers in the early 2000s, um, which we've made a lot of strides along the way with the populations that are coming in. Um, a lot of these refugee programs, they help with education, um, teaching English, 
special skills, and really identifying what it is that um, those individuals bring to the table. Coming from a background in social work, we always say we start where the client is. Um, and I think that's really helpful in terms of what they're able to offer today and then an outlook for the future, which is what I think in early career TA, a lot of employers are looking at. They're planning for the future. What can that candidate bring me today, but are they potential to help me with an innovative idea? And I think refugees, asylum seekers, folks who are coming in um, are just like that. I think early career in that space is very similar in terms of the potential that candidates bring to the table. So if you have an opportunity to open your doors to a refugee agency who's looking to partner with you, I would absolutely say take advantage of it. There's an agency, if not more than one, in every single state, almost every major city um, that you live in and that's next door to you. You just might not know it. Um, refugees are your neighbors. And I think that's one of the things that people tend to forget is there are opportunities that are needed as well. The same way with early career talent, these are opportunities that they need to build their career journey. So very similar kind of stories, um, just the skills base might be different. I will say with refugees and asylum seekers, you could get someone with tons of experience. You're just not prepared for that um, when you think about the traditional refugee. Um, so really great opportunities there. Like I said, they're in every yeah. state, state agency. You can look yeah. up. Um, USCIS has information about it. Um, mm -hmm. so happy to share. Well, very good. And, and like you said, I, I think... Uh, there are places that are, you know, asylum states, asylum um, cities, uh, et cetera, um, you know, where where large portion, large populations of refugees have come. Uh, Salt Lake City is one of those so. um, cities. Uh, so we have many refugees, especially, you know, I'm thinking from uh, some African countries, the Congo, uh, et cetera. Uh, and what, what a wonderful, yep. yes, exactly. And what what a wonderful opportunity to, to connect, not only in a way that will help benefit these individuals, but yeah. to benefit your organization. And if you're thinking from a, a framing of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you're trying to increase, you know, the diversity of your team and, and the equity in terms of opportunity, uh, what yeah. a, what a great opportunity to to reach out to these populations. Yeah. And I think people just don't recognize it in, in their day-to-day -day lives. So I know that during the pandemic, if you were to look at your grocery stores, if you were to look at people that were delivering your food, you tend to start thinking about, oh, man, I didn't know there was someone from the Sudan here, but they've mm -hmm. lived here for 15, 20 years. That's mm -hmm. also the engineer who was not able to get a job in engineering and is doing something else at the time. Um I think that population has also really taken a jump in terms of career journey. They're taking the classes for IT. They're taking the classes to get their degree license. They're getting these opportunities, and they really use the pandemic as a launching point. I think the same way that candidates being virtual in the early career space use that time to better themselves when internships weren't quite there. Um, in the pandemic, now that they're ready to kind of jump into the market again. Very, like I said, very similar storylines there in terms of ways to kind of improve yourself, ways to kind of open doors. Um, yeah. That was one of my, my missions in higher ed was to open doors to opportunities. And I would mm -hmm. say I learned that from the refugee side um, is creating those spaces and, and letting more people kind of in the doors as well. Yeah, so so these uh, asylum locations, sanctuary cities, uh, mm -hmm. these these places, there are many of them throughout the country. Uh, if, if for anyone listening, if if you're in proximity to these populations of individuals, please think about how you can utilize them. It's it's going to help your business. It'll help them and their families. Uh, so it's it's really a win win. Um, now let's transition a little bit and talk sure. a little bit more about Gen Z. Uh, what are some of, you know, I, I teased it a little bit at the beginning. We do see a little bit of difference in terms of priorities, uh, how how Gen Z are, are approaching the workforce as their early career. Um, what are some of the, the the biggest differences that you see? Now, of course, with the caveat that we know that we're, you know, painting with broad brushstrokes here. Not every Gen Z is the same, but generally speaking, uh, for this cohort of of individuals, um, what what do you see as some of those differences that employers need to be taking uh, account for and, and paying attention to?
I can speak in generalities, but I can also speak to the fact that Yellow, we do a lot of surveys. Um, we want to know the candidates who are using way up. They want to tell us about their experiences. So we have some data that that I can share as well. But I, I will say in terms of the the the, the one thing I would say is these Gen Zers are more on the front lines than they've ever been before. They're the folks who want to see the changes and the differences uh, in your organization that are reflected by society. So as our society grows, they want to see those things as well. So they're the folks who are looking at sustainable efforts that your company is making. They're looking at your philanthropic efforts and your foundations to see where your money is going. They're also checking social media more. Um, we speak of TikTok or we don't speak of TikTok, depending on your stance. Um, but candidates are using that as a source of truth. They're looking for information and news there, and it crosses over into their career journeys as well. Um, so I think they're mimicking what's happening in the world, and they want to see that not only in your practices, but in the workplace. They're looking for individuals that look like them. They're looking for technology. I think we surveyed a group of students, and they said um, they won't apply to a job if your recruitment methods are outdated right? Because it doesn't speak to your innovation. It doesn't speak to what you're able to do in the marketplace. Now, that could just be a branding message that has not been translated well, and that you have had longevity in the field, and you feel like you don't need to change your technologies or your recruitment methods because it has worked. But this generation tells us that that's not always the case. They're less likely to apply for a role if that's the case. The other part of this is, I think, they're looking for a commitment to diversity. And we mm -hmm. saw it very clearly during Black Lives Matter protests in 2019, 2020, over 80% of Gen Zers um, factor in an employer's commitment to diversity into their decision-making process. And if we know that they're thinking about that when they're making their decisions about their career journeys, where they're starting, where they're going to get that first taste of what it's like to be in the real world, they're hoping that that aligns with their employer. Uh, in higher ed, I would teach, how do you manage uh, making those decisions with your own values? And we all have different values. We all have different priorities. But when you're aligning that with your career journey, are you thinking about things like financial decisions? Are you thinking about ethics when it comes to the workplace? And those are questions that this generation is asking more and more because the millennials ask those questions. They're the ones who put it out there. Gen Z is pushing it further ahead because they're so vocal about it. As we think more about that, you know, I, I see, I've seen lots of data around kind of the activism, the, the, the activism posture of Gen Z, like they want to be engaged, they want to be involved, they want to make a difference, they want to have a social impact in the world, they want to do things that are meaningful, that add value. Um, and not to say that other generations didn't want that too, uh, but especially younger and earlier career and just feeling like they they should have a voice uh, that they should be able to contribute in meaningful ways and they're not willing to you know go work for a company for 20 25 years quote unquote pay their dues um and then maybe someday make a difference you know or give back Absolutely. that's that's just not in in their um yeah you know, in their mindset at all. And, and so what does that mean for organizations? If we want to rec recruit top talent, you just identified, you know, DEI efforts, uh, technology efforts, uh, several things that you need to be paying attention to. One of the things you need to be paying attention to is your your corporate social responsibility, your ESGs, your um, social impact efforts within your organization. And how can you leverage those as recruitment tools for Gen Z individuals? And, and that requires more than just platitudes. It requires more than just nice PR uh, and and um, and putting out statements around big events. And, and, and we're done with performative allyship, right? Ex exactly. Like they need to see that you're actually doing it. Authenticity. This is the number one thing for the. I mean, I will say higher ed. That was the number one thing that came up for 12 years at Georgia Tech. Um, and when I was in higher, I was there for 10 years. Prior to that, I was at an, another institution. And every single time we talked about employers and careers, authenticity came up. And I wish that was a statement that I could I could land on and go, this is fact. Because it's out there. We see it. It's in other reports. But it's never been really studied as well as it probably should have. It's because candidates are looking for that authenticity. The challenge is you'll never really see that when you're on a LinkedIn. 
right? People are going to share the highlights, the things that I really liked about my job. If I lost my job or was let go, they're never going to tell you the negatives. You won't find out until you dig deep. You're on a, um, you're looking at reviews that are, you know, buried down on a glass door, or you really have to find that, but you're never going to know who it's from. I think this generation is not afraid to tell you about themselves, not afraid to tell you about yourself and the fact that they're going to post it about their experience. They're going to have a, a letter that they've, an open letter that they have written. They're going to tell you when they don't stand for these things. They're going to tell you, think about the Google union um, where those were led by a lot of young people who said, we need to figure out a way to make ourselves sustainable. We need to figure out a way to make sure that the company is aligned with what they say they are and what they're going to do in terms of technology and ethics. Um, we really think about those things. We think about how they treat people of color in AI. Those are the kinds of movements that we're seeing from that activism. But also, retention standpoint, Gen Z is less likely to stay, as you mentioned, they're not going to stay the seven plus years. They're not going to make it a 25 year career. They're likely to stay less than three at this point. So what can you do? One of the things I would suggest is making sure you have a retention plan. Know your data. First off, you need to know how are you retaining? Who are you retaining? Are you losing more people of color, women, LGBTQIA, if you have those metrics? And if you don't have those metrics, now is the time to start taking a peek at your data to see what is your retention already. And then start thinking about, is it our ERGs? Are we doing enough? Do we have these groups that create an inclusive environment? That's the biggest one, creating an inclusive environment. For candidates in Gen Z, they are looking at safe spaces. I want to go to work and feel like I am valued, but I feel like I can be my true authentic self while the company is also showing me who they are and what they stand for. Do they give us an opportunity to volunteer? Is it paid time off to volunteer? Even better. So they're looking for those things, and that's what's going to keep them around. They're going to want to stay for a company that they see that aligns with their own values. And if you have the opportunity to promote within, 60% of Gen Zers are looking for that promotion train. So keeping them there and creating an opportunity for them to be innovative, to show you what they're capable of, and to create those spaces is another opportunity in terms of retention. I love this population because they're so vocal about what they need. So we have this kind of information to make those decisions. And if we can step out of our own way sometimes, we can really lean in because they have such diverse voices. They have such unique backgrounds. I learned from the 18-year-old intern or my student assistant in, in, in the office as much as I learned from my supervisor who's been in, in higher ed for 30 plus years. So there's always something you can gain from that person because she might be a young mixed race woman in engineering that's trying to figure out what she's going to do, whereas this person has been in their career and settled for a long time. Her innovations and her ideas might be helpful. And I love that about this generation because they do offer so much. You just have to work with them and teach them some of the, the best practices, if you will. You know, there are managers who are wringing their hands around this whole like younger millennial and Gen Z workforce and like they're so entitled and why did, why do they expect all of these things? Um, you can wring your hands over that and you can be frustrated by that all you want. It doesn't change the reality that this this is the <laughs> the dynamic within this labor force um, subgroup. And if you yeah. want to attract and retain good talent, you're going to have to figure out a way to attract these individuals. And if you yeah. don't, then you're not going to get them and you're going to become more and more obsolete uh, as the shifting nature of work and, and yeah. the world of work uh, changes over time. Yeah, it's funny you say that. It's because we just did a report, our state of campus report uh, for 2023, and 44% of the organizations we interviewed said that diversity sourcing is among their biggest challenges in campus recruiting, right? Thinking about organizations. But 54% of those organizations weren't setting diversity goals. I mentioned earlier that those candidates are looking at a company's diversity. They're looking at their inclusion efforts when they're looking for a job. So imagine that same thing happening, yet you don't have any goals, you don't have anything set in place to help attract those candidates nor retain them. So there's a lot going on in this space that can be done with a little effort. Um, and it does take some time. Yes, I'm not saying DEI is going to happen overnight. There's no, this is not a band-aid approach. 
but you need to put in the time and kind of figure out what are your goals? Where are you going? What are the opportunities that we have? And it comes with having that data um, and kind of talking to those candidates. You can start within your own walls, right? And figure out what you can do. So as you're working with this population and you're trying yeah. to help these early career professionals, what are the some, some of the things that you're doing specifically to help them navigate this, recognizing that their attitudes, their priorities may, might be shifting, but there may yeah. be a lag time in how organizations are responding to the needs and the demands of this population. Uh, and you still want to get, you know, launch your career. You still want to have a great job, um, great opportunities. You want to progress. So what kinds of things are you um, saying to young career individuals in the Gen Z population around coaching and helping them prepare, yeah. you know, within this current context? Yeah, I think one of the things about Way Up or Yellow Sourcing, um, we just rebranded um, the Way Upside for the employers. And I think if I'm speaking to the employers, Yellow Sourcing really does train candidates to be better candidates, right? So thinking about their resume and experiences they can gain in the space, thinking about that volunteer and how to tell that story on their resume, thinking about the activities they can get involved in. I know that coming into college, we used to have candidates walking in the door as sophomores, just by credits alone, the number of classes that they've taken. Um, I worked with computer science and computational media students at, at Georgia Tech. Um, and they're walking in with so many hackathons under their belt. And they're walking in with these projects that they had been working on with their peers in their classes. Not everyone. And I think that kind of inspiration to, to do more is a really good thing in that if you found what you're interested in, go ahead and lean in a little bit. Know what you want to do, kind of figure that out. And those are the kinds of resources we're, we're pairing in with, but we're also exposing them to career opportunities across the board. One of my favorite things about Way Up is that we have employers across all brands and all industries. So if you ever thought that you wanted to be a software engineer, did you know you could do it at HEB or Hannaford Market, right? Or did you want to go to a Dell? Okay, maybe we work our way up to that Dell internship by starting somewhere else. Did you know that you can be a, a, a technology associate with a consulting firm? Most candidates don't think that way. So we're creating these opportunities and spaces. We host uh, virtual events. And we know that candidates still love virtual events. Um, they're going to those about 30% of the time in terms of recruiting nowadays. Um, the others are in-person events. But those virtual events allow them to hop on anytime, anywhere from the comfort of their home while they're walking in between classes and looking in on their phone and learning about an opportunity that they didn't even know existed for them. So we're expanding their idea of what it is to work in a certain industry. And I think that's what's going to be helpful for them. Some of this is going to be helpful if there's an eco economic recession. Where are the opportunities? Where do they exist? Do I look at a Dell or do I look at maybe a supermarket chain that's still going to need me to work on their mobile apps? And I'm able to do that because I've learned these skills along the way with my career journey. So we're teaching them the basic skills, but we're also expanding their, their knowledge and understanding of what their career could look like if they were just to step back a second. Well, Kristen, this has just been a really great conversation. I note the time. I'm going to have to let you go here in a few minutes. But before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, uh, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Um, we can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, my name is Kristen Steele, C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N. Um, it's my first name. Uh, you can also reach out to uh, yellow at yellow.co. Uh, and learn more about our recruiting efforts and DI sourcing. Um, you'll learn more about our partnerships with in universities and programs and ways to get in front of over 7 million candidates on our platform. Um, I think the last word I will say about the DI space is something I mentioned earlier. We're done with the performative allyship. And I think it's important now, even more so, today where we see young people who are willing to step out of their classrooms and march to capitals. We're seeing individuals who are protesting statewide um, laws. They're looking at their career and looking to you as a corporation to take a stand. So if you're not able to do that at the moment, get there. Get to a point mm -hmm. where you feel comfortable sharing 
what your beliefs are as an organization because it's going to value it's going to be valued more than ever by this generation of candidates and your millennials and Gen Xers who are looking to make a career change uh, down the road. So get out in front of it. Yeah. Amen. Kristen, this has been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what you can do for them. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. If you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.